When I first heard about the show The Mandalorian, I wasn't exactly thrilled. From far away, it looked like a mediocre, masculine gaze television show soaked in nostalgia and Easter eggs. But when I went to Star Wars Celebration last year and was able to attend the panel, John Favreau mentioned the monomyth and Joseph Campbell, and I froze. Really, I started my curiosity about Joseph Campbell and the writer's, you know, the hero's journey uh, and the monomyth through watching his films and the power of myth. Uh, with Joseph Campbell shot at the Skywalker Ranch when I was young. It was really influenced me tremendously. A lot of people these days gravely misinterpret Campbell's contribution to story, myth, and psychology. People think it's outdated, it's overdone, or mistakenly believe it's a rubric for writing. That's Christopher Vogler, by the way, not Campbell. Creatives in Disney and Lucasfilm have casually mentioned the hero's journey before, but not in this way. And it got me thinking, did John and Dave have a movie night to watch The Power of Myth with Bill Moyers? Did they share copies of The Hero with a Thousand Faces? Did they dig into Campbell's Mythos lecture series? Am I overthinking a simple mention of the monomyth? Probably. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, maybe, just maybe, The Mandalorian is actually a Trojan horse waiting at the door of a typical Star Wars fan, looking like a nostalgia-drenched Boba Fett when it's actually far more sophisticated and transcendent. So after watching and rewatching and rewatching, I wanted to analyze The Mandalorian alongside mythic characters and themes as discussed by Campbell. Joseph Campbell describes 17 stages of the hero's journey, and these stages are most easily broken out into three areas. The ordinary world, the special world, and the return. These can be seen as symbolic settings which the hero travels through as he goes on his inner and outer journeys. When thinking about Din Djarin's hero's journey, Percival and the Holy Grail really stuck out to me. Percival's name means pierce through the middle. Campbell says that Percival's story is about a realization here on Earth through human natural means, wherein dark and light, all pairs of opposites, yet not as opposites, take part. Black and white are the qualities of every act. Every act has both good and evil. What are you going to do, living, since everything you do has two effects? He says, all we can do is lean toward the good. In other words, Percival's journey is about finding the God within, as many heroic journeys are. In the quest for the Holy Grail, all of the knights of King Arthur's court are called to search for it. So they entered the forest at the point that they had chosen, where there was no path. If there is a path, it is someone else's path, and you are not on the adventure. So if there's no path, how does one know where to go? You can get clues from people who have followed paths. Do you want the chit or not? But you have then to tear them off that and translate it into your decision. That which we intend, that which is the journey, that which is the goal, your own potentialities. Campbell describes the wasteland as a place where people are living inauthentic lives, behaving the way of others rather than of the heart. The theme of the Grail is the bringing of life into what is known as the wasteland. The wasteland is the preliminary theme to which the Grail is the answer. In Navarro, people live as dictated by power or by creed, rather than of their own volition. What is missing in Navarro? What is the grail that will heal the wasteland? In episode one, the Mandalorian is given Beskar as a deposit, which we find out is actually metal for his armor. In the myth of Parzival, Parzival is dressed by his mother in fool's garments so that the knights will refuse him. However, when he comes to King Arthur's court, he defends Guinevere's honor by fighting and killing the Red Knight. He then puts on that knight's armor. This parallel can also be seen symbolically in Mando's backstory prior to the events of the show. Din Djarin wears the armor of the Mandalorians, but he is not a blood descendant of them. When Mando goes to Arvala 7, he meets the mentor Quill, who tells him he must continue the path on a blurg. Your ancestors rode the great Mythosaur. Surely you can ride this young bull. Which is basically a meta commentary asking the audience to ride the myth once again. Give it a second try. 
Parzival's story continues after he takes the Red Knight's armor, as well as the man's horse. Because Parzival does not know how to stop the horse, it takes him as far as it can go, where he meets a mentor. The old knight teaches Parzival of knighthood in order to become worthy of his daughter. Parzival realizes he must become a true knight in order to marry her. Now next, he lets the reins lie slack on the horse's neck. In this tradition, the horse represents the will in nature and the rider represents the rational control. Here, nature is what's moving us. Trusting nature is important. It takes you where you need to go. Now, I wouldn't say that the child is the holy grail. Rather, the child is a meta-commentary on the Star Wars myth overall. How the child is perceived and handled by everyone in the Star Wars universe could mean that he is a chosen one of sorts, but I get the feeling it's more than that. This is how Lucasfilm is passing the myth onto the next generation, by reminding the parents of kids now what Star Wars is really about, and how precious that story can be if you nurture it, as if it were your own child. The holy grail for this story, for Din Djarin, and maybe even for the child, will likely be the reward for taking the inner journey, finding the true self that goes beyond what society dictates. In Campbell's terms, that is the true boon or elixir. So Mando continues on, discovers what makes the child so special and dangerous, and now Mando goes back to Navarro. Reminder that we are still in the first three episodes and the first third of this journey. We are still in the ordinary or known world. This is Mando refusing the call of adventure. He wants to stay in his ordinary world. There is only one way in and out of Navarro, and it is through an archway taller than any building around it. This is important because whenever the hero journeys from one world to the next, he must cross a threshold which signifies a step in the inner journey as well as the outer one. The Mandalorian might come and go through this archway numerous times, but he only truly crosses the threshold into the special world when he does so with the child. And now, Din Djarin has stepped into the special world, the world of the unknown, the world of possibility. He has accepted the call to adventure. Parzival roams the land, defeating foe after foe and, as the Code of the Knights demands, sends those he defeats back to King Arthur's court to serve rather than kill them himself. This eventually gets him noticed by the court. Parzival spends much of his journey wandering in the wasteland, between heroic adventures, between what his society wants from him and what he desires. This is the epitome of the wounded masculine in myth and is most often healed through a woman's love. The title, as always, gives away the theme of the episode. This place is a sanctuary from those who want the child, or so we think. It is also a place where Mando's mask is questioned. His creed and his honor are put to the test. This often happens when knights follow their passions. They end up in places where honor is not as important as love. They forget about their knightly duties. They forget about the court. In the monomyth, this is where the hero meets with the goddess, the feminine. The hangover of an old, old mythological theme, Yvain does become her spouse. He forgets Arthur's court. Now you know what this is. You have found your bliss but it has disengaged you from your world of duties. And he's there with her. But the knights of Arthur's court go searching for Yvain, eventually find him and remind him of his duties. And he goes then with the Arthur's knights to the court and forgets the ladies. This is a basic spiritual problem. The split between the two worlds Obviously, season one is not the end of Din Djarin's journey, so hopefully he reunites with Omera in the future. In the monomyth, this step in the journey is the atonement with the father and the realization of the ultimate boon. Normally, a hero would come face to face with a father figure of sorts, and either figuratively or literally kill that figure the act symbolizing both a rejection of that potentiality and an at one minute with it. Mando is sort of a father figure himself, so this step is inverted in a way. Mando is the father figure who has to kill his younger self in order to protect the ultimate boon. Doing so is a rejection of the past and an acceptance of his own compassion. He has chosen his bliss.
This episode begins with Mando refusing to return to the ordinary world. He goes to the belly of the beast where he basically meets his shadows of himself that represent how he deals with violence and killing. The one who kills for money, the one who kills because that's all he knows, the one who kills for pleasure, and the one who kills because he is programmed to do so. Later on, deep in the belly of the whale, we also meet the traitor, again symbolizing Mando's darkest thoughts of himself. He is a traitor. Money. The man who left me behind is not my savior. By the end of the episode, Mando has dealt with them all in slightly different ways. If he would have killed all of them, it would have meant, in Jungian terms, that he didn't integrate his own shadow. Instead, he locks away the crook, the sadist, and, before cutting off his horns, the monster. He kills the soldier to defend the child and tricks the traitor. Mando finally answers the call back to the ordinary world. He regathers his allies he met on his descent and crosses through the threshold on his way back. Sadly, this is also the part in the hero's journey when the mentor departs, leaving the hero everything he needs in order to complete his quest. Is it still a hunter? No, but it will protect. Stop that. Identify yourself. I am IG Lip. How is the wasteland going to be cured? The answer is by the spontaneous act of a noble heart whose impulse is that not of ego, but of love. And love in the sense not of sexual love, but of compassion. That's the sense of the grail problem. In Wolfram's story of Parsifal, the grail is actually a stone, which he gives the name Lapis Exilis, which coincidentally is also a name given to the Philosopher's Stone. The quest for the Philosopher's Stone being a symbolic quest for enlightenment in alchemy and in myth. By the power of the stone, the phoenix burns and becomes ashes, but the ashes restore it speedily to life. They can carry immensely heavy loads and the, the tears of healing powers. The symbol of phoenix fire illustrates the middle path between the spiritual and the earthly, where metaphysical and moral planes intersect. It is the eternal and the temporal, death and resurrection. No living thing has seen me without my helmet since I swore the creed. I am not a living thing. When Din Djarin is trapped in the fire, he symbolically dies and journeys deeper into the underworld. Here, he again meets with the goddess, who grants him a new boon. You are as its father. This is a sort of intersection between Din Djarin's compassion and his honor. It is the middle way, what all knights must learn. Thank you. I will wear this with honor. The goddess also gives Din Djarin a jetpack. Have you trained in the rising phoenix? When I was a boy, yes. The heroes then come to the final threshold where they come out from the underworld back to the ordinary world. IG 11's sacrifice is a rescue from without, a sacrifice that's made by the society for the hero. Din Djarin is resurrected, then becomes the master of the two worlds and takes flight. Din Djarin learned true compassion at the end of season one, and he learned to value life. However, Navarro is no longer his community. The Wasteland has now been given the elixir of compassion, but now our hero must continue on his journey, possibly to save the Mandalorian community. Through doing this, Din Djarin will have to find his own path that further transcends the creed of the Mandalorians. He will likely have to remove his helmet, fall in love, and sacrifice his honor for the good of all. That is the journey of a hero. The Mandalorian does a lot of things that the end of the Skywalker saga did not. For me, the end of this show healed my soul slightly after the rise of Skywalker. Although it's not a true ending, it completes a full cycle of the monomyth. It echoes other parts of the myth of Star Wars. And the message of the myth really shines through. For me, the Mandalorian is the keeper of the myth, and he will guard it well. He will keep it safe and will nurture it as it grows up, forming a new hero that will continue the cycle again. And for me, that's Star Wars. <laughs>